please take your seats. Our panel is Film Facilitation, UK and India's 2023 co-production journey. It's part of the Knowledge Series of the Film Bazaar, and it's the first panel that's going to be kicking off as part of the Knowledge Series. I'm very excited to introduce the panelists to you who will come up on stage and take their seats. We also have a very, very special surprise at the end of this panel. Um, as you can see, there's something there, and I will let the moderator uh, tell us what that's all about. But please do stick around. We have something very special to share with you only at Film Bazaar. Starting first with Sri Pithul Kumar, the Joint Secretary of uh, Films and also the MD for the Film Bazaar. Please give him a huge round of applause. We also have with us Agnesia Moody. She's from the BFI Film Fund. Hello, Agnesia. Welcome. Kajri Babbar, the director of the film Lioness. Please give her a huge round of applause. Shainab Alam, the producer of Lioness. Please give him a huge round of applause. And last but certainly not least, Aditi Rao Hedri, the lead actor in Lioness. I would now like, now like to call on stage our eminent moderator, uh, the very famous Mr. Naman Ramachandran from Variety. Please give him a huge round of applause. Naman, thank you for being with us and thank you for moderating this panel. works now. So thanks everyone for staying back after a morning and a half of uh, pitches, uh, many of which looked uh, amazing and I can't wait to see the rest of it on the video catch up. And thanks all of you for being on stage today. So we don't have much time, I mean we have lots of time but we have lots of speakers as well. And so uh, I think I want to ensure that everyone gets heard and there's time for questions uh, at the end. And so we are going to use um, the very first India, official India-UK co-production, Lioness, as a case study today to discuss uh, the subject on stage. So let's start with the creator of Lioness, Kajri Babbar. So Kajri, this is your baby. Tell us how it came about and why a co-production. Um, so I think I have been very lucky and blessed that uh, even at the beginning of my career, the British institutions have really helped me. So I was on a British Council scholarship to study my filmmaking at Arts University Bournemouth. And then post that, I was sent to, by British Council, fully sponsored to University of Cambridge to study further for politics and leadership as well. And that's where the subject of suffragettes is what intrigued me. Because I am a woman and stories of women and history of women interests me. And those are the untold stories. Um, but when I started to look at the suffragette moment, I found out that there was a brown woman, not brown woman, Punjabi woman. And I am a Punjabi as well. So there's a lot of intersectionality that came towards Princess Safiya Dalip Singh, who's the granddaughter of Maharanjit Singh and goddaughter of Queen Victoria. Um, and then that's how I started to write about her. And it was supposed to be a biopic. But she's a princess, and she's so grand in life that there was something that wasn't so relatable for me or, or for me as a woman today um, and a common woman today. So that's where Simranjit's character came on board. And that's very important because not all of us are princesses, but we still are women and we are fighters. And that's what Simranjit represents. And she's a woman who lives in 1990s South Hall. So the story is about two Punjabi British women living in United Kingdom a century apart. And the first one is Princess Safiya Dalip Singh, and the second is uh, Simranjit Kaur in um, South Hall. So let's move to Aditi. Um, Aditi, uh, how did you come on board this project and why? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd first like to say that um, it's a huge honor being here today. Um, also, to be a part of a first co-production, uh, which is exciting, but I think what makes it more special is the subject. How I came on board is <laughs> when uh, Kajri told me that this is what she's making, I assumed that I would be a princess <laughs> because that's what I usually am called for. And when she told me that I'm not the princess, I was like, yes, <laughs> tell me more. Um, so I did know what it was kind of about because I knew I knew it was uh, the story of Safiya Dalip Singh, but um, 
this, uh, the story that goes into Simranjit is what really, really interested me because of how she's juxtaposed these two uh, women a century apart. Um, and wh when she was narrating it to me, it was also, I was so excited by it because, you know, we've all grown up hearing about, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the whole feminist movement, uh, what it entails. S sometimes we've also heard people saying, but why is there such a noise about it? Because it's come easy to us. But I think it, it really, it, it sort of made something very, very apparent to me is that the sisterhood of women, whether a century apart or whether in, in our own neighborhood or whatever it is, is not bound by, not decided by, not dependent upon anything cultural, uh, political, um, historical, it is really about that sisterhood. And I think that something that it's so important that this story is told because a larger struggle impacts an individual's journey. And to me, as, as a woman and an, a, 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 an actor working today, I understand, and just as a woman actually, not just as an actor, I understand that that larger movement is important. However much we may be alienated from it because it, it happened at another time, but it empowers me today to make decisions that I make. And I think that really, really stood out for me and I was so happy to hear this story and I was so uh, happy that these two stories are being told, you know, uh, and, and it really, um, it made me feel very uh, sort of grateful that she thought of me for it, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll come back to you uh, in a moment. And Shanab, I'm saving the crowd-pleasing question for later for you. Uh, but we'll go to Agnieszka first. Um, the India-UK co-production treaty was signed back in 2008. We are now in 2023. Uh, why has it taken 15 years for the first co-production? Okay, I'll, I'll try to unwrap this question. It might take a little while because I would like to first take us back to the very definition of co-production, especially this of official co-production by a treaty, uh, because that's a quite special beast and we're quite used to it in Europe. The official co-production is an expression of political will, really, between two governments that decide to encourage collaboration between uh, film sectors in, in each of the countries that signed that treaty. And this is what happened in 2008, where those opportunities were seen by both governments and the expression of um, ambition to support joint collaboration between the two countries was sort of enshrined in a legal text. Because that's what it is, the treaty between the two countries um, ensures, that's very important to understand this, that it ensures that a co-produced film acquires a status of a national film in each of the co-producing countries. And that has pretty real consequences because it means that the film gains access to national public funding and other support. So a film which is co-produced under treaty between India and the UK counts as British in the UK and counts as Indian in India. It's both, it's not either or, it is both of those together. And what goes with that is access to public funds, which normally are available to your own filmmakers, right? Just like the funds from the corporation here are primarily aimed at development of the national industry there are equivalent funds like that in the UK, and they are primarily committed by the government to grow the UK industry. But on this co-production ticket, both producers gain access to each other's opportunities. So um, that expression of, of interest was there many years ago, but I think over the course of 15 years, the conditions for co-production have improved uh, greatly in both countries. We've all heard amazing, exciting uh, announcement last night from India, really raising its game in international production with 
incentives um, being much more generous as of today. So that is really good prospect for international collaboration. And also in the UK, um, we have sort of a new, fairly new tool that enables uh, UK producers to be more confident co-producers. It is a new fund that we have, um, that has been operating for just, it's in, it's in third year now. It's called UK Global Screen Fund. And it's clearly focused on co-productions. So it's not, because there's also a, a main national fund which supports national filmmaking. That, that filmmaking fund can also support co-productions, but it's not its main job. So it will, it will not necessarily prioritize co-production, whereas UK Global Screen Fund has been designed exactly with that in mind to encourage co-productions. It can support film or television, uh, television in the genres of uh, documentary and animation only. And for film specifically, it enables UK producers to assume the role of a minority co-producer. So it is assumed that our producers will be helping producers from other countries who are leading projects to enhance production, to give it some, um, to blend in some UK elements, use some of the talent that we've got in the UK to enhance the project, which is clearly led by producers in other countries. And this is a proper game changer. I promised technical people to give them the cue for playing the trailer for UK Global Screen Fund, so that's the cue. I'll keep talking, and when I stop, if we could play it. <laughs> so that fund um, now enables our producers to really engage in conversations with producers in other countries that bring their projects to us. And um, it is uh, designed as uh, non-repayable grants, which really helps on co-productions when you structure the financing plan. The, um, the maximum amount is 300,000 um, pounds, and we can only come on board when there's 60% of financing already confirmed from other sources. But we are supposed to come as minority co-producers, so that kind of goes without saying that there should be some money already confirmed. Are we ready to play the trailer? James, welcome to Darlyland. When did you become a writer, Miss Jane Fairchild? You're not old enough to go in the front. I've never done anything interesting or remarkable in my life. I can't be scared, not in my own house. Bringing a Terry Pratchett story to life, you're just guaranteed joy, excitement, and beauty. My husband, the subject of your thesis. Probably will want dessert. Thank you. So, so you see that um, I think in 2008 we didn't have, neither did we have those incentives in India, nor we had this specialist fund that encourages co-production. So, funding-wise, we're getting into a better place, I think. But another thing that I would like to stress is that. Signing a legal document is not going to necessarily automatically result in collaboration. So the very fact that we are here, we're very grateful for that collaboration with the NFDC, 
that we came with a group of um, active producers from the UK. You can give a little wave if you want to show yourself. They're all seeking collaboration and projects with, um, with India. They're taking individual meetings. And that's, that's where the comp productions will come from. We just need to get to know each other much better. We need to understand better which stories we want to tell together, because that's another principle of co-production, really. It's about those stories that we share, because there's such rich cultural ties between India and the UK. We surely have, as demonstrated by the case study, it's a, it's a co-production made in heaven in terms of its story and premise and tone and international appeal, all, all that. So there surely must be more stories like that, but we need to get to know each other better, each other and also realities of our markets, because we're quite far away, but it's possible and should be done that we get to know each other better and then collaboration will be enabled. I think that is the shortest answer I could muster. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to pick up on the word you just used, which is collaboration, and um, move to Mr. Kumar. Um, what are your hopes uh, and dreams uh, going forward for UK-India co-productions? First of all, let me uh, thank everyone and for showing such interest in one co-production between India and UK. So India has about... 16 co-production treaties with the countries. I'll just, uh, although most of the points about the co-production treaty and the production under that has been covered by her, but uh, I'd just like to tell you some side points also. See, co-production, when two countries sign it together, it is mostly because, you know, they share some common stories. And that is how, and they, the, the filmmakers will be there who will sort of make films where on those common stories and some part of uh, shooting and production will take place in either of those countries, so both of those countries. And that is how we say that both the governments get together and they say that each one of us will encourage filmmakers to make such films by giving them cash incentives for whatever has been done in their, uh, in their country. So, uh, like this co-production treaty which, uh, which India and UK have, and uh, which Naman rightly mentioned, and he, he's a journalist mind, he picked it up, why, from 2008, and still not, still, this is the first, uh, first film coming after 15 years. So, I think Gandhi was missing. Gandhi is, uh, I think, incentives were not there from, on our currency, Gandhi is there, so uh, that was missing from our side. Last year, we had announced in, uh, incentives in Khan's which were applicable to, from April 2022. Then only I think the interest rose wherein people thought that if we get a co-production, if, if, we, if we make a film under the co-production treaty, we will get incentives A from UK, which was earlier also available, but we'll also get incentives from India to the extent of 30%. But uh, that incentives were limited to about 2.5 crore rupees or I would say some lakh of dollars. With yesterday's announcement, now this cash incentive go up to 30 crores. So uh, anybody coming in India and spending 90 crores, it's, it's like he's only spending 60 crores because, I mean, the rest of it is given back from government of India to as an incentive working under the co-production. So that means it's much, much bigger an opportunity for a filmmaker to explore the larger money available with him to explore and make a better film. And I'm sure with the synergies, which stories, I believe, they were always common between, I mean, we know so many families which cross live between London and Mumbai and other cities of India, and I mean, that is very, very common. I think there is a lot of uh, Indian diaspora there, there are a lot of uh, Anglo-Indian community living in India, so there are stories. But I'm sure with this thing there, where the government is also propping these stories and they're wanting people to make such films, so I think more and more takers will be there and we'll have much more collaboration, as you said. I think so for those who missed the, you know, the big announcement last night from the Information and Broadcasting Minister, Mr. Anurag Thakur, it's uh, quite simply put, uh, the, the cash back or the reimbursement of applicable spend on any approved co-production in India has gone up from 30% to 40%. And uh, the... 
And the uh, bigger news is that uh, the cap, uh, it, it was earlier capped at a maximum of 260,000 US dollars. Now it's gone up to 3.6 million US dollars. So, so like how, uh, you know, countries like Malta and Morocco attract all these big ticket Hollywood films, you can expect to see that in India pretty soon. Oh, and if you have significant Indian content, you get a further 5% on top of what you already get. And uh, if you're interested in the subject, there's a panel on it tomorrow, which I'm moderating, attend. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now coming to Shanab, who's been waiting uh, to unleash, uh, t tell us why this film, Lioness, had to be a co-production. Um, of all stories, Lioness needs to be a co-production. For a film that is going to be helmed by a first-time female director, for a story that is led by two female protagonists and uh, played out by two brilliant actresses from UK and India, unfortunately, in the Indian financial, mainstream financial market, and uh, a third point, a historical. Now, between these three points, it would have been very difficult to raise the money in India privately. I mean, uh, our mainstream market does not allow us. So this uh, co-production validates the project. The fact that the two countries putting their faith and trust, you know, it, it just gives that much of confidence so that the money can be raised. Otherwise, stories like this will never be told on screen. It's, it's that basic fact. So this story and stories like these need co-production. And of course, there's a benefit. The benefit is that, um, you know, the, the the footprint of the film increases massively. You know, you have the UK and you have India, the markets of the UK and India supporting the film, so it, it, it travels wider. We've had that past experiences. And um, it also kind of uh, helps the film to kind of qualify, um, you know, more and more for the British, for instance, the British, uh, you know, whatever the qualifications are, so the money will then bring in better talent, better talent then increases its, its again its validity, then you apply and you get uh, the screen fund. So there are criteria, you know, so it's like a cyclical thing, it just keeps improving, the, it keeps improving the, the film's standing and positioning. So yes, there are stories that are very interesting, most of them don't get made, they remain on the paper because there's no support, but the co-production is the way out. So. Um, coming to the talent, uh, going back to the talent aspect of what you said and coming to you uh, again, Aditi. Now, you've headlined uh, a project like Jubilee, uh, which is a period project and in enormously successful, not just in India, anywhere where Amazon Prime Video has a footprint. It's one of their most watched shows. And um, what, uh, as an actor and as a woman, what can uh, people like, uh, you know, you and Kajri do to change the mindset of the private wealth that is uh, funding uh, this country? I'd love to answer this question. <laughs> so the thing is, it's so easy to um, feel frustrated by the system. But the thing is, the, fa the, 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 the whole beauty of cinema and the magic of cinema and the, the power of telling stories, I think that's what keeps us crazy people going, you know? That we keep believing that it will happen, it can happen, and also, honestly, change comes from us as well, from the individual. Because if we constantly um, try to fit in, um, then we're just part of a like, then we're just part of little boxes, you know? And it takes a lot to believe in the individual journey, in the individual legacy of telling stories, of telling stories that are larger than your context at that moment, and to believe that that, that is important. Because quite often, you know, we're also young when we join the industry, we are told many things, advice is given to us. But I believe if you just hang in there and really believe that things do work work out around you. Like even this, I never in my wildest dreams, yes, I did Jubilee, I'm doing Hira Mandi, I've done some lovely stuff, I've worked with Mani Sir, uh, I've, I've, I've worked with some incredible directors. 
but um, I know that it has been a very unique journey for me. Um, the funding hasn't come overnight uh, because uh, it, it is, uh, I mean, whatever it is, our industry, as you know, is complicated. It, it functions in, in a particular way and it's not so easy to maneuver it, especially if you want to work a certain way, if your dreams are to work with certain directors, to tell certain stories, etc. But I feel the funding, etc., is something that if I keep thinking of the funding, I'll not be able to work. I have to think about uh, the artistry of it. I have to think about the stories that because I'm an artist, I'm, I'm an actor. And um, if, if I start thinking of all these things, it will mess with my head. Because then I'll constantly be comparing, I'll constantly be running a race. I have to always remember I'm running my own race. And the people who uh, want me there and who believe that I will bring some, something to the table will find me. And I will be there to de deliver because I truly, passionately love what it, what it is that I do. And I love the journey of it. So I'm not a great person to answer the whole finance angle of it, but I, I do know why it is that I do what I do and believe in, in what, what it is that I do. And uh, then, uh, you know, headlining a show like Jubilee or, you know, or, or whatever other work it is that I'm dreaming of, even sitting here, it, it happens. It works itself around it because intention is the most powerful thing. You know, uh, that is the only thing that is actually in my control as an artist is my intention and why it is that I do what I do and what I intend to bring uh, to every second of what it is that I do. That's I a great that answer. answer that. And uh, Kadri, uh, Shanab mentioned uh, a global footprint. Now, who is the audience uh, for Linus? Linus's, rather. I mean, I think I was very clear when I was writing it. It's story of Indian women for the world. So the target audience was always international. Um, and of course, we are going to watch it because it is our story. And, and globally, if you see when Indian women are shown on screen, um, they probably would not be shown as warriors. And this is a story of two warriors. It's not a sob story. It's not, uh, it's, it's a thriller. It, it, it has action as well. So, so that's the story. And specifically when you asked her about, you know, how it is to tell the story of two uh, actresses as the lead, the amount of times when I was making, and I was in pre-production or even pitching it to people, the amount of times people ask me who the hero is. Uh, because in India we do uh, have the hero mentality and we look at the, the man in, irrespective of, I tell the story and narrate it and I'm still asked who are the male uh, actors. Uh, so I think, but on the other hand, I wouldn't say that men were supporting me uh, to make this film as well. I mean, Shanab sir is a man, Prithul sir. I mean, when I reached out to these institutions and both BFI and NFTC were so encouraging. Uh, to see a young girl coming there, you know, I, and it was a domino effect. If I did not have them, I probably wouldn't have, uh, you know, the funding as well from the private sector. And also women like her who are trusting on a young female director, you know, to, to say a uh, yes <laughs> on an Director, not female director. <laughs> yes. Uh, but director, not female yeah, director. Yeah, 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 thank you. I mean, that's the whole part of... Yeah, yeah. Also, also the part that I, I mean, thank you for correcting me because I have to correct myself every day. To be a feminist is a choice every day I have to make because patriarchy is not just in the system; it's within me as well. So it's a it's a journey. I'm a feminist in making, and uh, so that's the point. So thank you. Yeah. That's <laughs> so now let's bring it back to uh, some basic practicalities. Uh, Agnieszka, can you tell us uh, some of the benefits of uh, what this project, a project like Linus is, or any other project, will gain from being a, a co-production. Yes, thank you. So I, th I think I would like to link it to the ambition to reach the global audience, because that is that is ultimately easier to do on a co-production which already has this nucleus of two countries. So a film such as Lioness is a British film. Just hold that thought, it's for, for a UK co-producer of that film, it's their domestic film, and they're using all their networks that they have in that part of the world to offer the largest possible exposure and audience to that film, because for them it's also their own film. 
just like for Sanab, it's his own film here in India. And there's always that potential, often that, that, that potential goes beyond this bilateral collaboration that co-produced films tend to more easily find um, exposure and audiences in many other countries in the world. So good luck with, with that universal story on very strong themes, feminist themes, um, and I'm sure you will, you will get there. So apart from the most obvious benefit, which is access to public funding that otherwise would not be available, right? Because without that treaty, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have access to those uh, public funds, of which there are several in the UK. There's several different sources where you can um, engage and um, secure funding from. It's not only the BFI, which is the main sort of national agency that runs not one but two funds that support uh, development and production, but there's also um, other agencies in, in, we are four nations in the UK and each of the UK's nations also have uh, public funding for film. So who knows, you might find a collaboration partner in the UK, in Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland. They all support and have ambition to grow uh, the film sector in those particular nations. And not to be forgotten, is the access to tax reliefs in the UK, which is not dissimilar to the incentives here. And this is where really, um, um, that, that's a lot of money because that's the money that comes straight from treasury. And this is what we call automatic support, that as long as the film qualifies, which the co-produced film will qualify, it is entitled to a tax relief of around just over 20%. It is on, calculated on the UK expenditure in, in the UK. So that money also becomes um, available to co-produced films. Um, and apart from that, I think it's also about um, access to funds that are not necessarily just for production, but there is support for festival launch or for distribution in the UK. It's very competitive. It's not necessarily automatic that every co-produced film will secure distribution, but at least it has this national status, so it means that it has access to distribution support just like any other British film would. Um, and finally, I think perhaps it's also those magic lines in the credits when we say an India-UK co-production that also helps to qualify films with their nationality for prizes, awards, and all that. So that, that also can help, uh, again, with the exposure and awareness of the film. And uh, Mr. Kumar, uh, what would be the benefits uh, from the Indian point of view? So the benefits are mutual. So both of us get a benefit. One very important thing is that because it's a <clears throat> national film for both the countries, see, it also gets the audience of both the countries. So being a, being a, it, it's like an Indian film now for us, and the, it'll be released as an Indian film across the theaters. So that is the kind of access which, is, uh, which the film eventually has. I'd like, just like to add a couple of things also to this, that uh, A, yes, money is important, that, uh, you know, funding is being given. In fact, we've been earlier when di India didn't have incentives and we still had co-production treaties. I mean, there were, I think, 14 of them which we continued uh, till we started our incentives in 2022. So people used to say it's because, you know, most of the European countries, they give incentives It's if it is a co-production. So although we were not giving incentive, but the incentives are coming from other institutions like BFI. And we always had examples of BFI that they were very generous in granting their funds. And so people used to approach us for that uh, procedural co-production. It was mostly like that. Probably didn't happen with the uh, this. Uh, UK, but it happened a lot with France, Germany, Spain. I think we had a lot of co-productions. But, uh, you know, coming from it, I would also like to tell you one more thing, which uh, in the back end is very important. At the same time, we are announcing a rise, a hike in the caps of incentives. 
And that is that in a year, we are already in the process where everything will be made seamless and online. So, you know, people would not have to approach with their co-production agreements for our approvals from the ministries. The incentives will not require physical submission of documents. You know, all of this we are working on. And apart from that, uh, a couple of more things which are important, not just from the point of view of an international producer who's coming doing shooting or doing some post-production work in India. But it, it's important from national point of view also. Anybody who's doing a shooting or a shoot uh, at any place requires, of course, approvals from the ministry for visas and all that. But then on-ground clearances are, are difficult to get. I mean, there are several agencies. So a lot of states have come forward, and uh, some of them have also granted uh, uh, clearances, saying that if you apply and within a, within a week, if you don't get it, you are deemed to have it. But India is a land of uh, you know different states and different rules and policies. What we're trying to do as part of central government, we're trying to integrate all of it into that ecosystem of that portal, FFO portal, Film Facilitation Office portal. And we'll probably uh, put them all together and say that use this sandbox to have online clearances as well through that portal. So even if you have a system, that will be integrated in the back end. If they don't have a system, still be integrated. That is our dream, which we, by the next film, Bazaar, which we, should, we are already working on that, but that's a huge thing to do. That'll be the real ease of doing business uh, as we foresee. So that's, that's also becomes very important. I think uh, we're working on that. And then now, uh, I think it's also, now more and more co-productions are coming. I think we receive in, uh, in the ministries, now we receive a lot of co-production ratifications from four, four, five, five countries. I think, you know, people are uh, getting funding from different agencies, you know, especially filmmakers who really have that passion to make stories of these kind. In fact, you know, we had some request in which I saw that, you know, the request has come for approval. It has got only 5% of India's co-production, uh, this thing. The rest is like 30% Germany, 20% Spain, <laughs> UK. So I said, why are they coming to us first? Where are the other people? They said, no, no, yours is easier. So that's why we're coming to you. <laughs> so, but then I send them back. I said, first, you know, you have to get the approvals from the major co-producing partner. But uh, I would also like, uh, you know, tell you something that uh, when we started this FFO way back in 2016, the government of India started this. And in our guidelines, we have laid down that the timelines for giving approvals for not just co-production, but shooting in India was one of the concerns so for the visas. So we had enlisted a timeline of 20 days, and I'm happy to announce that even after so many years, the average stands below that at 16 and 17. So, you know, there have been a couple of projects which difficult in the sense that, you know, they had such scripts which were not getting evaluated, took more time, but then that only says that we've still stuck to that timeline and Film Facilitation Office offers this kind of a seamless service one of the services which I'm also proud of in the part of the ministry. And we are trying to just make it better so that, you know, the filmmakers are away from the hassles of these uh, things and they are able to concentrate on these creative things. And filmmakers like Kajri, who are so uh, good and uh, they are coming up so well. I think since 2008, we were waiting for Kajri to come and, and meet uh, Aditi and then, you know, create this lioness. <laughs> and I was so happy that the subject's name is lioness. Because, you know, there are several movies I hear of made on Lion, Sing, Singam, but yeah. none of them had Lioness. I mean, I don't know why it, is, yeah. it has come so late. So, but then congratulations to both of you to do that together. Thing. Considering the Lionesses do all the work. <laughs> okay. On that note, I think we have time for just one question from the audience, and then we have the surprise. So, uh, the question from the gentleman in the front. Shanab, you made uh, Ugly, you were part of Lunchbox and Zoom and many other good films. Uh, what has been your chief learning from this uh, production experience in the UK? From what I'm going through with Lioness? Okay, this has been, this has been definitely, a, there's an evolution. I mean, I must, I'll take this opportunity to thank that FFO really, really helped because, um, you know, earlier, like you rightly said, we would go pillar to post, uh, but this time, 
actually because of FFO being there, things have been very, very smooth. And uh, number two, <clears throat> I think over the years, the whole communication, the whole relationship, you know, intra-industry between different countries, particularly India and, you know, Europe, that has improved because the number of films that go for co-productions have increased. And uh, with yesterday's announcement, and I think I speak on behalf of all filmmakers, directors and producers, that this would give a position of strength to Indian filmmakers to go to Europe and say that, okay, we'll, we have something back home. Otherwise, it was very difficult to convince European co-producers because we didn't have the answer. What are we gonna get from India? So, yeah, it has evolved. That's what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you, that's all we have time for. And now it's time for a surprise. And Jitin, do you want to take over? So ladies and gentlemen, at Film Bazaar and Knowledge Series, we're going to give you the first look of Lioness. We're unveiling the poster for you right on the stage. Let's have Aditi and Pritul sir please unveil the first look of Lioness. In three, two, and one. And can we also have the image on stage? On, on, there we go. There's the image on the screen for you all as well. Shenab, you want to talk a little bit about this, this lovely work of art that you and I have been talking about for a month now? <laughs> Credit goes to uh, Chaitanya Sun, uh, who's really is an artist. I mean, he read through the screenplay, had numerous conversations with Kajri, and then, you know, there are obviously elements from her story, and this is what he came up, and I think it's absolutely brilliant. It's simple, very effective, and uh, very proud of this. Thank you for unveiling the poster with us. Ladies and gentlemen, on that note, please give them a huge round of applause. Stay tuned for Lioness at a theater near you, the official UK-India co-production, and we will now take a quick break and move right into our next panel. So please, and quick break, five minutes into our next panel. All the best for the team, and I'm sure that uh, it'll do well in both the countries and everywhere in the world. And can, and can we have a photo op of the entire team right here, please? 